coming up on the Orthopreneur Podcast. My kind of default is about a page and a half outline. And what I find with that is it keeps me from wandering off into the woods and getting lost, which, you know, we can all do. Welcome to the Orthopreneur Podcast. I'm your host, mystery author, Amelia D. Hay. On this podcast, I will bring you writing, book marketing, and self-publishing advice so that you can create your dream author business, build your author platform, and be creatively independent. You can find the episode show notes and lots more information on the podcast page at orthopreneurpodcast.com forward slash podcast. Hello, writers. Up until now, I've wanted the seasons of this podcast to be evergreen and act as a resource on how to write a particular element of a story. My desire to create short evergreen episodes focused on a single topic is the reason this podcast tends to be free of interviews. However, throughout season three, I will share short interviews with other writers discussing how they write stories and in particular I will try to interview as many writers who pants novels. But these interview episodes will be treated as bonus episodes and will not be the focus of the podcast season. In light of this, in this bonus episode I will chat with Michael Brent Collings on how he writes his fiction novels. Before we dive into the interview, here is a brief introduction to Michael Brent Collings. While he is best known for horror and is one of the most successful indie horror authors in the world, Michael Brent Collings has also written internationally best-selling thriller, fantasy, science fiction, mystery, humour, young adult, middle grade works and romance. In addition to being a best-selling novelist, Michael Brent has also received critical acclaim. He is the only person who has ever been a finalist for a Bram Stoker Award, a Dragon Award and a Roan Award. And he and his work have been reviewed and or featured on everything from Publishers Weekly to Screen Magazine to NPR. As an engaging and entertaining speaker, he is also a frequent guest at Comic Cons and on writing podcasts like Six Figure Authors, The Creative Pen, Writing Excuses and others. Throughout this episode, we will be referencing tools and services that we've used. If you're interested in reading the transcript or would like links to anything that we've mentioned in the show, then check out the very long blog post or edited transcript at orthopreneurpodcast.com forward slash TAP032. And if you're new to this podcast, I want to say a huge thank you for stopping by and trying out my show. To those of you who've been faithfully listening, thank you for regularly listening in and supporting me. Your support means more to me than you know. Without further ado, let's get into the interview. So hello, Michael, Brent, and thank you for coming on the Orthopreneur Podcast. You're actually my first official guest Prior to this, I have tortured my audience with just me (laughs) (laughs) and my ramblings, but they seem to like it. Reason to love that. (laughs) And today, I want to chat with you about how you write, because you've written as per the as per the introduction that you've just seen or listened to, depending on whether you're watching the video or the listening to the podcast. Um, you've actually, you've written qu- quite a number of books in many in a f- quite a few different genres like fantasy, horror, science fiction, and you have a pen name like a yeah. romance pen name. Am, am I allowed to mention that? Or is it- oh yeah, absolutely. No, I'm not. I'm not. A sh- the only reason I do it as as a pen name is because I found out that. I have the wrong male, well, the wrong genitalia for writing romance. Like there's a, <laughs> a oh. large swath of people that just won't even look at it with a man's name. <laughs> so it's like mystery, really. I have to, I write under initials because I think everyone else does it. And it, it, and it is a male dominated genre. Yeah. There are yeah, a few see- exceptions to that naturally, but. Yeah, you make you, you know you make concessions as part of the business decision. So, so my uh, my romance name is Angelica Hart. Oh, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen those books. I don't actually I don't read romance, mm. but I um I have seen the books. Cycling through your Amazon. Yeah, they recommend a lot <laughs> of things to me. I think they're pretty confused. As oh to, my gosh, I know. Yeah. It's like, what does this girl read? <laughs> yeah, my Facebook feed is like that. Like, I've got all sorts of, just due to my, you know, my following, I have all sorts of people following me. And they're like, 
look, he's either a 45-year-old man interested in Viagra and an affair or a 14-year-old girl looking for Pokemon. Like, I get such a weird range of ads and crap in my spam mail. <laughs> yeah, I get that stuff too in my... um. I get a lot of American political stuff in my uh, in my email for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, because cause the world wants to depress you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yeah, it's a, uh, that is something that uh, I'm glad that we have the cutthroat, horrible world of uh, publishing to retreat to when yeah. politics get too much. Yes. Mm -hmm. So where do you get your ideas for your book, for your books? Uh, you know, it varies. I think sometimes, you know, like the there's the beautiful kind of dream where the muse comes out of heaven and encircles you in unicorn hugs and, you know, this idea bursts into being full blown. And, th and that has happened once or twice. Like I remember really vividly, I woke up uh, from a dream and the whole story was there and I just had to write it down. Most of the time, it's a lot more low key and a lot more drudgery. I mean, um, I think sometimes people think I want to be an author, like I want to put my feet up on the porch and think authorly thoughts. And I'll do my two or three hard minutes of work every day because, you know, ethic. Um, and in reality, it's a lot of kind of banal stuff. So when I'm coming with an idea, you know, I go, well, what genre am I going to write in? Uh, what interests me? If I'm writing horror, I'll go, oh, it's it's time for a paranormal. So, you know, how can I make an interesting ghost story? And I just pull out a pad and I start brainstorming and and uh, asking questions of myself. That's a large part of my process. Just, you know, it kind of consists of, well, what would be scarier? Who would be most afraid of that? Where could I put that situation to maximize the emotion? And so it's just kind of a, a very craft-oriented, um, detail-oriented kind of thing. There's nothing magic about it. It's sitting there, and uh, my family knows not to talk to me when I'm during that stage because I don't respond coherently. Just so much of my brain is taken up by mumbling questions. And they're like, Dad, the house is on fire. And I'm like, but what if it's a zombie? What if it's a geezer? <laughs> you know, and they're just like, oh, Dad's in his in his little story fugue. So let's leave him alone. How do you know if a book is scary enough, especially with the horror genre? Because I find with my books, even not that my books are scary at all. It's more, they're more murder mysteries. And I can't tell if the murder is hard to figure out from page one because I already know. So how yeah. do you know whether something's scary? Yeah, I think, you know, the murder mystery is a great example because you do know and you're like, I'm not going to surprise myself. And um, similarly, horror, I think it's hard. There have been very few times where I got a shiver of something I was writing because you know, it originated for me. So at least I knew what kind of a creepy human it was coming from. Um, I think a lot of it is just with horror in particular, it, you can tell a story and have it be violent and gruesome and have it be turn out be hilarious, you know, or you can tell a story about going to visit the jelly factory where they, you know, they make strawberry jam and have it be a horrific experience. And a lot of it's just in the telling, you know, if I'm in a horror, if I'm in a comedy, I'll say, you know, he flounced across the room or he tripped across the room. If you're in a horror story, you're going to glide across the room. You're going to move wraith like across the room. You know, there a lot of it is really okay. just the choice of adjectives and verbs and things like that. And um, communicating a sense of dread through language is one of my favorites. I mean, I love H.P. Lovecraft because if you read him. 99% of his stories, almost nothing happens. And it's just this feeling that he manages to create within you by his use of the perfect words at the perfect time. Um, so I think a lot of it is just that getting a sense of horror or vocabulary, or if you're, you know, operating in a mystery, that kind of mysterious double meaning vocabulary where you want the reader to read it ambiguously this way and at the end the inspector goes but what you didn't understand um and, and that's just something that you you get over time that's part of the learning process and 
when you've done it for 10 years, you know, it's like speaking a foreign language. You become adept and fluent at it. You no longer have okay. to run that translation. I've always wondered. I'm not a reader of the horror genre because I don't know. I just, I'm a bit too, I don't know, scared <laughs> <laughs> to put the book in my um, cart. And also some sometimes the... Especially with movies. Movies I find frustrating because they're always too stupid to live. Like, of course you're going to go outside without a weapon. Like, Yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree. In fact, I went and saw um, A Quiet Place 2. And on the one hand, I loved it because it had some of the greatest suspense and just wonderful sort of chills. And the scenes were great. Every moment that wasn't scary, I was sitting there going, why did you all become so rampantly stupid between the last movie and this one? Like, you know, it happens the next day and you just, you fell down the stupid tree and hit every branch on the way down. And so I, I totally agree. That's incredibly frustrating. And I don't mind it, honestly, if it's internally consistent. If you have a stupid character making stupid choices, Um, you don't want that to be the main character because they're just hard to root for. You're like, yeah, let the zombie kill him. This is a a Darwinian error. So let's fix that with this story. Um, But I do hate inconsistently stupid people where it's like somebody really nails it until the bad guy shows up and then they're going to run. Yeah. Out the, out the door with no weapon right into so-and-so's arms. Yeah. So, so frustrating and such a horror pitfall. It's like the hero who can shoot perfectly until the bad guys in his sights or vice versa. And then it's like, I will hit every link in the chain link fence, but I won't make it through any of the holes. <laughs> so how do you transition from having that initial idea, or as you said, the questions to going to getting to a place where you feel ready to write the first draft? Again, that sort of varies. I mean, so part of it is I write so many different genres. So like, I'm sure, you know, if you're, as you mentioned, you write mysteries. And if you write a mystery, you know how it ends. You you sort of have to. And you kind of work backwards from there and you lay out all the all the red herrings and all the real clues and then you figure out how you're going to tell them. Um, and I've written mysteries. And so that's a very different process. Sometimes I will just see to the pants that I wrote a seven book series called The Colony Saga. Uh, and it's an end of the world zombie apocalypse story. And I had some sort of overarching goals that I wanted to achieve, but I hadn't fully figured out where it was going until book five. And, and that's one way to do it. Um, A couple books ago, my poor wife came home and I had taken every single piece of furniture in our front room, pushed it to the sides and the whole floor was covered in three by five cards um, because it was a very complicated story. And so in that case, I had to write out all of the different things that had to occur because they're happening in different timelines. And I had to lay them out uh, in, a, in a way that made sense. And, and it was just like, sorry, honey, I need 200 square feet. Uh, I'll give this back to you day after tomorrow. Or so. <laughs> um, so it really, I mean, the answer is it just really varies. It goes from super duper outlined all the way down to, well, here's the first line. Let's see where it takes us. Um, and it and it just kind of depends on the story and and how uh, sort of zoomed in I am on on the particular moments versus uh, here's the beginning and here's where I kind of want to end up and and let's see where the characters take us. How much detail do you go into when you outline? Because I'm one of those crazy people who I have this massive spreadsheet because I I think this could be because I write murder mysteries. Because I have to know how the crime happened and I don't just map out the major plot points. Every scene is accounted for. Like the only mistakes I make are mistakes that I've overlooked. Like I've made plot holes that I haven't been able to see because it's been my thing and I've Mm -hmm. read it like 20 times and there are just things that I know that I forget, oh, the reader technically doesn't know this. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Why didn't everyone intuit that there's a helicopter involved? I knew yeah. it. <laughs> um, 
Well, for me, outlining, like I said, it kind of depends. If I'm doing a mystery, yeah, 100%, like you said, it's going to be very granular because you can't afford to just go, well, hopefully I'll lay out the clues in a good way because the my experience is you either forget clues um, and the ending is nonsense or you lay it out and the people reading it have figured it out by page seven and neither of those is fun. Um, if I'm doing something different, my kind of default is about a page and a half outline. And what I find with that is it keeps me from wandering off into the woods and getting lost, which, you know, we can all do. Uh, authors' minds are such Swiss cheese rabbit holes. I mean, they just go all over the place. Um, so that one and a half pages or so will keep me focused, but it also allows me to enjoy the process. I don't like feeling like I'm taking dictation from myself. Um, mm -hmm. And over outlining for me gives me that sense that that uh, I'm just, I already did this and now I'm just doing it again. And it's terrible because I don't want to listen to me tell me what to do six months ago. You know, <laughs> um, I really like being that guy who I'll go to a restaurant or something and sit in the corner with my, with my laptop and everyone sort of moves away because I've got my Unabomber coat and I haven't shaved in a couple of days. And I start giggling maniacally because, you know, some character just said something delightful and it came from me, but it's still a, a wonderful kind of a surprise. Uh, so I like when I can, I like to do a light outline um, and give myself some breathing room. But again, like I said, this, um, I, this book was called the forest and it operates through multiple parallel timelines. And that was my 200 square foot outline that my poor wife had to put up with. Um, but that's that's kind of the exception. I, I don't usually get that detailed. Okay. I find that if I don't have a detailed outline, like I do feel crippled by it in a sense because I've already done the fun part, which is mm -hmm. creating the story. It's yeah. the brain onto the page part that I struggle with. But if I don't do that sort of straight jacket outline – I will screw up. Yeah. And, you know, and that's an important thing for people who are authors. Like I always tell folks, if you stand up a hundred successful authors against the wall and put a gun to their heads and say, what's the secret to success? You're going to get a hundred different answers. And, you know, some people need to have that really detailed outline. And some people need to not have anything on the page and just start and see where it goes. And part of the trick of becoming a professional, I think, is getting to know your process, you know, because there are so many options and so many hybrid versions. I can outline the beginning and the end and sort of play with the middle or vice versa. And over time, if you're serious about it, part of the craft of it is learning, hey, I'm a pantser. Hey, I'm, I'm an outliner. You know, I write mysteries. And so like it or not, I'm going to do outlines or I'm going to find a different genre, you know, and, and, um, and that's a really cool thing. I love the infinite mobility, the infinite possibility of the creative pr process. You know, we, if we have a stick and some dirt to scratch words in, yeah. we can make magic happen. And I think that's just so cool. That is one of the things I do like about writing and publishing is technically there's no one way to do it like yeah. some other careers like finance there really is only one way like yeah and it's like that for a reason whereas with writing you can do it your way really you don't have to outline you can pants I have tried to pants and what <laughs> I realized I was doing is I had an outline mm -hmm. so I wasn't it was like this chapter I want this to happen and technically it's still an outline like I, I can't just flip open the my laptop and just start writing it's just I don't know it's just something it's not the way your brain works yeah something my brain's broken it would be far more convenient <laughs> to be well, able it, to flip open a computer and write like it's so much yeah, easier that, it would be but you know and I've found that pantsers, their problem is 
they get to page 400 and realize the last 200 pages were a huge mistake. <laughs> and so, you know, each, uh, each different version has its pluses and minuses and some are really fun, but you're going to end up in a lot of dead ends and some are a little more workmanlike and it takes some of the fun out of it, but you get to the satisfying part, which is finishing the fricking book because that's the best part is being able to write the end and take a sigh and it's like oh i got that out of me how nice you know? <laughs> it's like being violently ill at a certain point you're just glad it's over and sort of relieved <laughs> you sort of touched on this earlier but what do you do when you're writing the first draft and you're either stuck i get this thing where i become anxious about a scene that i know isn't going to work or you just don't feel like writing. Although usually if you dig a bit deeper, there's an actual reason. Yeah. What do you yeah. do during I'm... those moments? So I think that's a, that's a great question, especially for new writers, because like there's a point at every single book where I walk out of my office and I, you know, I go into the house and I'm like, this is the one, this is the one where they discover how much I suck. And not only do they realize this book is the worst, but they go back through all my old work and they're like, all of this is terrible. And I have, you know, a hundred thousand people who want a refund. And that is something that just doesn't go away. You know, there's always that, that, that doubt that hits us. That said, and that's a psychological quirk. That's not, that's not the work. That's just kind of a hurdle that writers go through. And part of that is because we're working in a vacuum. You know, the response is six months away. It's like telling a joke and the punchline. And then six months from now, someone will laugh, hopefully. And, and that would make jokes a lot less fun to tell. So that's just a, that's a situational danger. You know, that's, that's an occupational hazard. Um, that said, as far as story beats and stuff, I very rarely have trouble thinking of stuff. Um, and part of that is just a mindset thing. I used to be an attorney. And when I was writing a brief or researching a point of law for a client, I would sit there and stare at my computer, which was empty of words. And I would be thinking, how's the, you know, what's the best way to argue this? What's the argument I want to make? And I wasn't actually writing a single darn thing. I still build the client for that time because oh. I was working. Oh. And I think a lot of writers get hung up on, I'm not typing in this instant. And so I must not be writing. And that's not, that's just not true. And so if I, you know, what most writers think of is, oh, I'm stuck. I'm just sitting there going, okay, so I have a really interesting story question to deal with. Um, how do I get my main character out of this hole that he's been dropped into a pit with, you know, poisonous spikes and stuff. And instead of going, oh, I have writer's block. I'm just saying this is, this is part of the fun is I get to spend significant time coming up with an answer. Um, people think authors are geniuses and they go, oh, you're so smart. And you thought of this amazing thing. And the secret, which I'm about to give away, is you spend six hours reading my book that I spent four months writing. And so I would hope that four months of me is smarter than six months of you. <laughs> and, yeah. and knowing that, it takes a lot of the pressure off. I don't have to think of the answer in the next two seconds. I don't have to be typing. I'm still doing my job for the day. Just so happens that today's job is answering a question. And sometimes if I'm really stuck, hey, part of the writing day is I step back from the computer and I go watch a movie or or I used to before COVID ended any everything. And yeah. and uh, thankfully, you know, I've got my vaccines, so I'm going back to the movies and stuff. Um, so I'll go see a movie or I'll read a book and I don't sit there and go, I'm not working today because that's part of working is going to different sources to get inspiration. Um, and if all else fails, I tell people put in a helicopter by which I mean, you know, this guy's in a pit. I can't figure out how to get him out and I'll write. And then the helicopter appeared with the rope. And what I mean by that is I can have any nonsense thing happen 
right in that page, you know, page 800 of the book. And all I have to do is then go back to page 400 and mention yeah. it. And now it makes sense. You know, I just mentioned there's a helicopter and I thread that through a couple times. And now it's not ludicrous. It's an integral part of the story. So I think if you give yourself a little credit for working, whether you're typing or not, and if you allow yourself the breathing room to step back and go, yeah, this is a fun question, rather than, oh, my gosh, I have writer's block. Um, it, it really turns it fun. I think my anxiety about writing something I know is not going to work, it sort of stemmed in after I published my first book, I went and sought out reviews. And what I wish I knew before I did that was to not read them. Right. Because, <laughs> because when I submit my stuff to editors or beta readers, I'm asking for feedback. So when they tear me a new one, that doesn't shock me. Right. But what I, for some reason, I can't handle an opinion on someone on Amazon or Goodreads. And it's, I find that that's affected my writing. And also the, this, how do I describe it? I have this very locked in view of what writing is. And I think, like you said, fingers on the keyboard and I don't count research or like research I have to do to write a scene to make it believable. Right. And I, I think that's a, that's a trap that a lot of authors fall into. And, and it's because partly because we talk about word count, you yeah. know, like as soon as you become an author, as soon as you, and I'm not even talking about like someone who's being paid on the regular. I'm talking about like, this is a part of my life. And I talk to other people who write and it, that have to do it. And the question is always, what are you writing? How much did you write today? What's your word count? And, and that becomes the litmus and it's a false litmus because like you say, you can't write that scene. I spent 45 minutes once researching what kind of bulb would go into a specific uh, parking lot lamp. And it took up all of one sentence in the whole book. And I thought that was time well spent because I was creating a mood with a, spe with a specific kind of a light. I wanted to be able to describe it and have that verisimilitude. Um, for people who have ever gone into the yellow lit parking lot that makes everybody look like they've got jaundice and tuberculosis. And it was, it was totally fine to do that. But a lot of authors, they do that and they get to the end of their hour and they're like, I only wrote that sentence. And they're not concentrating on the fact that it is a bitchin' sentence that does everything they hoped it would do. They're just like, oh, I only got 60 words or 20 words. And man, I'd rather have 20 words for that hour than 8,000 that nobody's going to pay me for, you know, if they're 20 yeah. good words. But, but you're right. It's hard to get into that mindset. And it is hard to read reviews, especially like now I have, you know, in the tens of thousands. And if somebody doesn't like one of my books, I can kind of go, well, most people think otherwise. And, <laughs> and that's helpful. But at the beginning, if someone's like, this person sucks, and I wish they'd never been born. And obviously, they're they are the product of a of a condom that should have been recalled. You know, you're like, you're like, oh my gosh, because all of us writers suffer from low self esteem. Yeah. We do, um, and, but you do again. It's something that you continue and you get a little bit of perspective. And some of them are freaking fabulous. I love the one star reviews that were like, this was awful. It was so scary, I couldn't finish it. And I'm like, that sounds like a good review to me. <laughs> yeah, if you write horror, that's your dream review. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I post those. I post some of the great ones. My favorite review of all time is three stars on Amazon. And it was the headline was it was okay. And the entirety of the review was there were a lot of words. And I was like, that's just magic. I think that's hilarious. It's actually, I think it's my screensaver for one of my computers. <laughs> there were a lot of words. It's oh like, well, God. it wasn't a comic. Like, <laughs> Oh, it, it was fantastic. So you do kind of go, well, you know, somebody else has a different opinion. And look, if you could sell a book to one people in a thousand, you would have sold 7 million copies, 8 million copies. Um, yeah. But that also means 999 out of a thousand people are ambiguous at best and despise your work at worst. 
And that's a that's a mental mindset you have to be able to achieve if you're going to keep going. I ended up creating this creepy spreadsheet where I've actually monitored how many of what reviews I get, like five for the rest. And I've discovered that 60% of my people who read the book will actually like it. And there's mm-hmm. a 40 who either find a flaw in it and will be critical. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then there's the the other part of that 40%, which I think is like 27%, will just hate it. Right. And, and 90% of them are professionally angry. <laughs> professionally angry. <laughs> like there's people that you... Like you could probably click those people's Amazon, you know, profile and find basically the thread is I wish everyone was dead. Oh, but now that, (laughs) but now that Amazon do this super fun thing where they can just put it one star and not leave a review, that's for me, that's annoying because I'm like, well, yeah, uh, the the person that is least invested uh, and, and I, I do look, Amazon has its way of doing things and they're they're I don't know, some people might not have heard of them, but they're this little upstart company. They're gonna do great things, <laughs> you know. Like they're obviously doing it right. Um, so I can't complain too much, yeah. but there's you know, I definitely don't like the fact that they wait bad reviews. Like periodically I have books that have ninety percent four and five star reviews and the top review listed as one star because yes. they've weighted it that way. I thought and, they just hated me. Yeah, that kind of drives me. Yeah, it's not it's not good. It's like, well, yeah, someone at Amazon thinks I suck. That's not cool. Um and and again, that's something you just kind of have to be able to deal with. This is a this is an emotionally taxing job. It is difficult. It is I mean, as a lawyer, I did not work nearly as hard as I do as a writer. Really? And oh yeah, I mean I work regularly 10 to 16 hour days. That's that is my normal day. And part of that's because thankfully I have a big following and I'm answering fan mail and I'm you know trying to maintain an online presence and all that stuff um and still write for a couple of hours a day. Um but part of it is it's just a tough job. And if you want to do a good job of it, it takes an inordinate amount of time and it takes a real uh, mental strength because you're dealing with your own demons. You know, there's that part of every writer that's like, you suck, just (laughs) just quit, you know, And, and that's an everyday thing. I don't know any writer who's just sitting there going like, I'm amazing. You know, like we all struggle with that. Um, And then on top of it, even if there's a thousand people that like us, we will. We see those three that are like, you suck. And you're like, yeah, those are the three that I'm going to let affect me. Yeah. And and that's just human nature. And it affects everybody. And, you know, I have a really good friend, um, Joanna Penn, who does the the Creative Penn podcast, which is a fantastic one. And she and I were talking, you know, off the air about marketing things. And she just said, like, you do a lot of Facebook stuff and I just can't do it because then I have to interact with people. And and that takes a lot out of her to interact that way. She's marvelous at interacting with people um, and an excellent podcast that I recommend to anybody. But that particular thing hurts her heart enough that she can't do it. And a lot of writing is like that. It's difficult and it's traumatic. And not only are you writing words that you hope people will like in another room where you don't at least have to see them, but then you have to walk out. And nowadays you make yourself part of the product, which means you're standing out there and not just saying, here, make fun of my book, but like, hey, now make fun of me, like Michael Brent personally. And and that's that takes something that's already difficult and makes it a thousand times harder. I have to admit, I haven't had any hate directed towards me yet, but that day will come. But it's, <laughs> it's more, it's um, it's more. They just didn't like how the story ended. Like it, it spoiler alert, it's not a happily ever after. Oh right, yeah, and and that's tremendously difficult to. It it is subjective, and I I don't mind people giving it a one star review. I really don't. Um, 
I do like people to recognize, I like the horror thing. If it was so scary, you couldn't finish. Maybe it's more than a one star book because that was its purpose. Um, and I do get upset to this day when people say nasty things about my fans. You know, like I will see reviews periodically that are like, obviously, everybody that has given this a five star rating is a moron. And I'm like, that kind of sucks, especially because there's like a thousand of them, you know, (laughs) Um, I didn't wrap up 10,000 of my closest friends to put Goodreads reviews, you know, Um, and and that's upsetting. That's actually at this point a lot more upsetting to me than seeing a review about Michael Brent, because I just think that like that kills reading that kills the enjoyment of it. And there's enough toxicity in the world without readers who should like have the most empathy. We exist in other people's heads. And then to sit down and say, but all of you people, for your opinion, you're meaningless or valueless or morons or whatever it is, that that's really sad. And I definitely encourage any reader out there, if someone says, hey, this book's awesome and you disagree, you don't have to jump on it and tell them why they're stupid. Just it's it's a different person. And I'm yeah. so grateful that we all like different things. That makes the world a really cool place. It would really stink if everybody was me. I'm not agreeing with you, by the way. Because <laughs> I realized I was nodding. I was like, oh, my She's God, like, that looks oh so gosh, bad. That would be the worst. If everything was Michael Brandt. Oh, <laughs> I forgive you. Sorry. <laughs> I do think the same thing about me, though. I do realize that I am quite quirky or as the kids in grade one said weird like (laughs) something I've told been told my entire life and I'm sort of used to hearing it but I do see what you mean if everyone were like us it would be pretty boring yeah yeah. I do like your point where you made that writing is quite emotionally taxing because when you get into writing you don't realize what you're really getting into and it sort of creeps up on you, and you, re- and then you sort of realize after you finished your first book, oh, that's it's actually quite a lot. Like I have to give myself a lot of mental health breaks, and just dis and time off because I can't just keep writing and writing and writing. Like it's yeah, really difficult. It, oh, it's devastating. Look, I wrote a uh, that the colony saga I was talking about. Um, so the point I wanted to make in that book, kind of like the thing I wanted to do. Um, The fun of it was to write a zombie story where everybody in it is nice because most zombie stories, it's like three episodes in, you're going, you know what? The zombies should kill all of them because they are moral sinkholes. You know, they're just all out for themselves. And there's, you know, the good guy and the rapey guy next door. But by the end of season one, the good guy is more of a rapey guy than the rapey guy. And, and so I was writing this story and I decided to base the main characters off my family because I was thinking like personally in the apocalypse, I think most of my neighbors would help each other. We wouldn't be trying to murder each other. And I had to write a scene in which one of the kids died and it was based on one of my Mm -hmm. kids. And of course this kid was not in a zombie apocalypse. He didn't die like that. Um, But I had to think, you know, if my son were in this situation, he would do this thing. He would do this heroic thing. And here's how it would end. And I came home that day um, because I write out of the house. I'm either in my my office, which is a separate thing, or I am like at McDonald's or something because they have free Wi-Fi and Diet Coke refills. Oh, I never um, thought of that. Oh, it's fantastic. Look, as a writer, you can either have a caffeine addiction or an alcohol addiction. Those are your two choices. Um, So I came home and I just, I could not communicate with my wife beyond to say I killed our son today. (laughs) And, and she knew she, look, we've been married long enough. She, she, and she's along with me on the ride. And uh, Oh my gosh, I got so lucky with her. Like, that's the one thing I will say any writer needs as a support system. And, um, and my wife is just, uh, just an angel. And so coming home though, I'm like, this happened. And she knew what I was saying. It was like, I wrote a scene where this character died modeled on my son. And even in a fictional sense, as it was, it was so hard. I, I mean, I literally 
was not able to communicate with anyone for three or four hours. And that is not the only time it's happened because, you know, people, people are like, you're, you're sort of the God of this whole universe. Um, but every God story I've ever read involves a lot of pain <laughs> on the part of yeah. the deity and certainly no, no different with writers. We go through um, these mental travails right along with our characters. And it's certainly cumulative over the course of a book or a series. Yeah, I definitely um, agree with that. But I write at home, so my husband has now realized exactly how crazy I am because I'll walk around. It, he must think that I'm autistic because I am. Um, I will walk around and it's almost like a stim. If I'm stuck, I will walk around because some, some for some reason the, the movement helps. Yeah, but we're in a two yeah. bedroom flat, so there's only so much space that I have. Yeah, well, it's the same thing with me. And it doesn't matter if you're in a two bedroom or a full house. Like when I'm really thinking, um, I do, I'll walk around in little circles and it, and, and it happens in random places is the worst part. Like I could set up camp right in front of the family television, you know, and it's like, oh, we're watching a movie. Um, nope, guess not. That's over because dad's doing his circle and mumble thing. And, and that's, honestly, that's kind of fun. Um, but it is weird for families. I mean, it's got to be, it took years for my wife to understand, like she would come out for a quote with a question or she's, she'll text me. And it took years and years for her to understand that when she did that, it wasn't a momentary interruption. I had to start a ball rolling. So her two second text put me back an hour and a half. Um, where I was just trying to get back into whatever rhythm I had achieved. And, and it is an alien situation for our caregivers. <laughs> um, and they are caregivers. My wife will walk out. She's like, did you eat? Did you go to the bathroom? Have you put on pants today? I mean, it's like she's got to be so tired of having a fifth infant, basically. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's a weird universe that we live in. And it's very hard to understand why, if you're not a writer, it's hard for you to understand why me staring at the wall and like going and like doing like my ASMR imitation, um, that that's super hard work. And I'm not just being lazy. That is digging mental ditches and it is heavy duty lifting. Um, that is a real hard thing for non-writers, non-creatives to wrap their heads around. I'm sort of lucky in the sense that my um, my husband has he's done a PhD and he's had to defend his thesis and he actually does um, how do I explain what he does? Well, he does coding and it's by nature it's creative. So he sort of gets. I think he sort of understands that staring at the wall for twenty minutes is technically work. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's and that's good. You need a, like I say, you need that support. You know, the number one indicator of success is someone willing to put up for, with you and, and keep you from throwing yourself off a ledge on a bad day. Yeah. My husband has definitely had to do that for me. Like he, I think he <laughs> believes in my work more than I do. And it's, oh, it's and nice to have that, actually. Yeah. That is a blessing. Because there's, look, there's days where we want to give up. And, and if you're a new writer and you're having one of those days, they go on. They're they're always going to be there. I you know I think the difference between being a successful writer and being functionally unemployed uh, is mostly a matter of attitude. Yeah. And this is I still go through this, and I make good money, and I've sold lots of books, and you know been up for awards and all that good stuff. And there's still days where I'm like, gosh, I I wish I had a job as a checker because at least I would feel like a normal human being. Yeah. Um, and plus writers have, you know, as a rule, we have the dental benefits of like a crack whore. So there's all sorts of things that we also have to put up with. Um, and we wish we could be, you know, normal people sometimes. And, and it definitely is important to have somebody there to say on your down days, look, you're not normal. Um, you you are quirky. Like the word you used was quirky. Um, but how cool is that? You made a universe out of that quirkiness and you've made a, a profession and a vocation out of your need to look at things strangely. Yep. 
And the last question, if you could go back in time and give that version of yourself that was about to write the that was about to write his first book, three pieces of advice, what would you say to yourself? <laughs> the first piece would be, are you sure you really want to do this? Um, yeah, writing is a very jealous mistress and it really does start taking over more and more of your life. You know, my wife, poor lady, she married this stable lawyer and uh, three years into our marriage, she realized the writing thing was actually a real thing. And <laughs> You know, and she ended up, she realized she and she had really married a closet nutcase. Um, so I'm not saying I would say don't do it, but definitely I'd say be real aware of, of what you're getting into. Um, the second thing I would tell myself is to write. And I mean, I'm glad I did that. I've, I've had a large output and it's because I believe that. But you can never have too many people telling you just write, write, write. Um, a lot, especially in today's universe, a lot of writers are concerned about marketing and they should be, but they forget you have to have yeah. a quality product to market. And so they get involved in building up an Insta following and then discover they don't have enough behind it to maintain it. Um, so the second thing would be to write. And the third thing would probably be bring your wife more flowers, um, <laughs> Because she is sincerely like, if you find that person who is willing to put up with your crazy and willing to be, love you enough to not only put up with you, but also to say like, you're acting like an idiot today, go out to the office and stop moping. Um, or on the flip side today, honey, you need to go and watch a movie that will help you. And if you can find that person who loves you enough to be kind and to be brutal when necessary, um, yeah. treat that person like the universe because they really are. Yeah, I definitely agree. So thank you for coming on my podcast, Michael Brandt. Um, this has been a great conversation and I can't wait to edit it and listen to it back. It sounds super crazy, by the way. If you don't have a podcast, you'll never get why. But um, oh, right. it's not so much to it. And, and anybody who's local watching the authorpreneur, like, holy cow, just know that this woman is doing a labor of love for you because it is, there's so much work behind it. I'm, I'm astounded by the job that you guys do. Yeah, it's definitely, it's fun. It's a nice break from writing, even though I'm talking about writing, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's as far as we can get. It's an addiction. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed it. And I, you asked some of the just awesome questions and were a genuine uh, pleasure to chat with. So oh, feel you. free to have me anytime you want. Cool. Thank you. You take care. You too. Bye. Thank you for listening or watching this episode of the Orthopreneur Podcast where I spoke with Michael Brent Collings about how he writes his fiction. I really do hope you were able to get something from this interview that you were able to apply to your own writing life or even you discovered something that you really need to change about your own mindset around the pre-writing phase. If you're interested in reading the show notes or the it's essentially a very long transcript or would like links to anything that I've mentioned in this show, then head on over to authorpreneurpodcast.com forward slash TAP032. Once again, thank you for listening and I'll see you in the next episode. Happy reading and writing, everybody.